Thank you very much. All right. So this will be challenging. So uh, basically, I'm just going to continue to post in the workshop uh, repo, uh, mainly because I want to make sure everybody has access to the, the content. Um, that is a link to a repo where you can just self-paste. Um, and David Bates, can you link it? Where's the link? Um, just drop the link again to all panelists. If you don't see that, it'll, there'll be a, a slide too as well where you can just type in the, the repo itself. Um, but the hope is that you could also do the self-paced. Um, not seeing the link, can you change? Oh, because I'm sending it to panelists, got it. Okay, panelists and attendees. All right, excellent. So now you see a link. Wow, all right, we're gonna get here. We're gonna, we're gonna make it through. All right, so that link is so you can do the self-paced um, content. Uh, what this is going to be a mix of me doing some slides as well as going through the self-paced content and encouraging you to do it. Um, I think we are, we got a roughly, I guess, 40 minutes left or 35 minutes left, which will be fine. Cause like I, I said, um, and I think, uh, someone raised their hand, but I'm not sure what that means <laughs> to be quite honest. All right. So this is going to be around automating your, your developer workflow. Uh, it's going to be through a tool called GitHub Actions. Uh, I'm just going to make assumptions. I usually have some jokes about if you ever heard of GitHub, but I'm going to make assumptions that you have at this point. If you haven't, um, you can open up a tab and uh, check that out. Um, as mentioned before, the slides are here. That's the link I just dropped in um, there. Also, if you go into the readme of that, that same repo, the, the link to the slides are also there as well. Um, you should be able to read the slides. If you can't actually see the slides, um, what I can do is actually make them viewable for everybody. But I'm going to go on a limb and think that the slides are viewable. But feel free to, yep, the slides are viewable. I'm just checking it. All right. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump into as well. So I work at this company called GitHub. GitHub's a place for collaboration um, through the internet. Um, it's really started with version control uh, using this tool called Git. Open sourced. Um, yeah, it's, it's open source ver version control um, system and uh, built by the creator of Linux as well. So just a lot of a lot of bullet points there, but that's GitHub. Again, if you haven't heard of it, just go to github.com, check it out. Um, but what I wanna talk about real quick is that GitHub has been shipping a lot of features. Um, and if you haven't been using GitHub for a long time, maybe you're a brand new programmer. Actually, let's just do something. If you um, just put how many months uh, you'll do months uh, that you've been programming. Um, just drop that in the chat. So good, 12 months, 60 months, cool. Yeah, so yeah, do the uh, calculation. So how many years times by months? Um, <laughs> 20 years. Uh, the question was months, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but yeah, you, you get the idea. Uh, cool. I love the interaction too as well. I love that y'all just like right at the ready, the chat. All right. So GitHub has been shipping a lot of features. Um, and I can't talk about features without talking about Beyonce because Beyonce, I'm a Beyonce advocate as well, which I'll get into. Uh, that's what I do at GitHub. Uh, Beyonce had a feature where that she shipped with Megan Thee Stallion uh, over the summer. It kind of blew up on TikTok. Uh, the song is really big on TikTok and then she came through with an awesome version that featured Beyonce. So Queen B. Uh, I like to make the joke that I'm Queen B at GitHub. Uh, GitHub has 50 million developers worldwide that it used the, the actual product. Um, Beyonce has a lot of people worldwide that actually listen to her. Uh, what I love about this is that I can talk about Beyonce. When I was in China a couple of years ago, um, Beyonce had literally just three months prior actually played in China, um, in Shanghai. Um, so she's a world renowned superstar and uh, I'm just trying to get to her level. <laughs> Stepped away for a second, came back to Beyonce. Excellent. Uh, slides, they're linked, they'll be linked again soon. But I mentioned I'm a Beyonce advocate. I'm really a, <laughs> uh, I'm really a developer advocate and um, I'm focused on engagement in the open source community. Uh, I basically what that means, I talk to everybody who doesn't pay us money. Uh, uh, for the most part, some foundation, open source foundations do pay money. But um, what I'm getting at is that I'm focused on that, but also I'm focused on this other tool called GitHub Actions. Uh, and what I like to do is I go to bat for the hive as well. So a couple years ago, about two and a half years ago, uh, GitHub launched this feature, well, two years and three months. They launched this feature called GitHub Actions. Uh, and really this tool is really to give you the tools to do what you need to get done at GitHub and then GitHub gets out of the way. So uh, we have 
uh, the GitHub API. GitHub API has been around for, at this point, so what, 2012, 2000? Yeah, so 12 years, 12 and a half years, GitHub's been around. The API has been around for 12 and a half years. So it's something that I think that GitHub's done a good job on. Uh, the documentation continues to improve too as well. So if you haven't checked out the, the latest version of the docs, uh, definitely check out docs.github.com. Um, but it has a really good reference of all the stuff you have available to you in the API itself. Um, so what I'm getting at is GitHub has all these things that we call primitives. Uh, primitives uh, being the API, the webhooks, uh, authentication through JWTs now. Um, all these different pieces so you can integrate with GitHub and build tools on top of GitHub. So if you've ever heard of like, so DigitalOcean just launched a new uh, platform to be able to um, ship sites uh, using their, their new UI. You can also connect the GitHub account to that. Um, company won't let me download the slides from the link. Okay. Um, the slides are really not important. What's really important is the, uh, the repo itself, but um, what I'll do is I can I can put a, I can host a um, a uh, a PDF version as well, um, which I, honestly the VPN will probably block a PDF too as well. So um, take lots of screenshots, I suppose. All right. Um, so actually, what I'll do is also I'll tweet out the slides as well. So if you want to then check the slides out from your um, uh, not from the VPN, maybe from your phone, you can also get access that way. So I'll, I'll do that. Uh, my Twitter handle is on the bottom right hand corner. So just look for a tweet of me pointing to you the slides after as well. All right. So what the focus on this is content is around improving your experience with GitHub. Uh, and it, the way I, I talk about this is actually automating workflows, workflows being developer workflows. Um, excellent. Cool. I, yeah, I will be looking at the chat the entire time. So this is this is your time. Uh, the slides are available, the repos available. So you could technically just take the links and then I guess go on your own pace and do whatever you want. But uh, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to slow me down. I know the chat is pretty vibrant at the moment. Every time I ask a question, you, you answer it too as well. But all right, focus. Automate workflows using the GitHub API. That's what we did with GitHub apps. GitHub apps are things like, so Netlify has a GitHub app, uh, Travis has a GitHub app, Circle has a GitHub app, Heroku has a GitHub app. So these are like package solutions that people can build and integrate on top of GitHub. Now these were, they're not massive. They're just like a lot, it's a it's a more of a lift if you wanna integrate with GitHub. And, and we realized this, where our focus was actually integrating flexibility uh, for integrators to build on top of our API and our platform. Um, and this is all around the this whole idea of like identifying repeated tasks. So for me, uh, I know I do every time I open up, actually open up my computer Monday uh, today, and I know I want to, uh, I want to go and check and see what my my teammates are working on because uh, I do have one teammate that this that started her day on Sunday because she's in Australia. Uh, but we do this thing where we open up an issue, and that's our stand up. So in our issue, we just say exactly what we're going to do for the week. And then at the end of the day, we close that issue. But because every week, there's like a Monday every week. Um, I'm not sure if there's like two things that are guaranteed in life Mondays and uh, up until recently taxes, but we don't have to get into that. But what I'm what I am focusing on is that I know I'm going to have to wake up Monday and tell the rest of the team on what I'm going to do. And the reason I do this is because we're all remote. Um, we're really focused on as asynchronous uh, communication and not actually being directly on a Zoom call every time we want to do like a stand up or a sync. Uh, so that's why I built a GitHub action to open up an issue every Monday or technically Sunday for me, but Monday for Australians um, to assign everybody on the team to the issue and then ask them what they're working on this week. And we call it the top five. So we just write down five things we plan on working on, uh, whether it's code related, whether it's like write this email or write this blog post or whatever it is. Uh, we just put that in the list. So that way everybody has an idea of what everybody's working on. And if there's opportunity for collaboration. You can just read through that on Monday uh, or Monday afternoon and then go and help out other folks. Or if you don't need help, then you just continue working on stuff. But at least everybody has an idea of what's going on. Um, but I automated that. And I wanted to bring up just really quick uh, about GitHub apps is that ProBot, it's a, we, we realized a couple of years ago that well, GitHub apps were complicated to actually get started. So we built this thing called ProBot. I say we, a couple of GitHub employees built this uh, to make it easier to uh, make it e like make these integrations off the bat. So if you ever use React, uh, they have this create React app 
Um, there's also other tools that have command line tools that are very similar, but they have create probot app where you can create a probot app, which is a GitHub app integration. Um, this isn't about probot. I just wanted to mention it because probot actually is built on top of this thing called OctaKit and OctaKit is an SDK uh, to integrate with the GitHub API. Uh, this SDK is ideal um, mainly because I, I love it because my previous employer that I worked at, uh, I used to write up like all these um, API docs and all these API integrations uh, for all these different tools like Twitter and Facebook and GitHub. Uh, and once I found out that SDKs existed, like my, my world changed because I didn't have to continue to write these things by, from scratch. So what I'm getting at is OctaKit exists so that way you can integrate the API easier. Um, but what I want to really mention about Probot, what really kind of wins for Probot and making it easier is that it all it does is just listen to webhooks. Uh, it takes a, an event on GitHub and then it triggers that with the API. Uh, and that's sort of like the bare bones, like the primitive of interacting and making automation. And I promise you, we will get to some hands-on things and looking at stuff, but I needed to sort of set the stage. Uh, we definitely had a lot of no's uh, coming up uh, on people who, who use Git Actions. Um, and now, honestly, the question should have been how many people have built something with the GitHub API? And the majority of you probably would say no. Uh, and that's a common occurrence. It's like, if you don't there's no need to build something in an API. Like you continue, you could, if you had to open up issue every Monday, like it might take, you know, 10 minutes to write up that issue and open it up, but you could still do it without integrating directly into GitHub's platform. So this slide right here, it is the list of all the workflows that are available to you uh, through actions. So I can run an action on deletion of issues, deletions of code. I can run actions based on anything that's um, changed. Uh, if the pull request has been opened, um, there's a lot of opportunity to actually run actions on different events. So just note that these events exist. If you just uh, search in the docs, events that trigger workflows, um, you'll find the whole list there as well. Um, as a beginner developer, I need a community who can get, guide me. So anyone like to mentor? Um, honestly, I would say there is a Discord in that URL, opensauce.pizza. Uh, you're welcome to join, that's my Discord. Um, you're welcome to join that and ask for ask quite as many questions as you would like. Um, do actions work the same on GitHub Enterprise instance? Uh, yes. Well, for the most part. So, and so uh, that's a good question. And the answer is yes, it, it does work the same. So we recently got GitHub Actions to work on Enterprise. Um, for self-hosted versions, like if you're doing some special stuff, you'll have to consult the documentation on the differences and what you need to get done. Um, I, I'm sort of like reaching right now because I haven't actually ran actions on a hosted version of, of GitHub Enterprise other than GitHub. So ironically, GitHub uses GitHub Enterprise to build GitHub. So I, nothing for me to make actions work is different. Now, your company, similar to the person who couldn't download the slides, like you could have a VPN or a firewall or different layers of abstraction, but like that's between you and your IT uh, admin or whoever runs DevOps or whoever runs the show at your company. Um, but for GitHub, uh, GitHub itself is, um, yeah, it works. Um, Gollum, that's a good question. Uh, and I honestly, um, it looks like I just lost my uh, chat. Hold on real quick. Um, GitHub API Golem. I um I was looking at that earlier today as well. I had actually not seen. Um, oh, you know what it is? It's it's the wiki. So Golem is actually what powers the um, the wiki um, the wiki feature on, on GitHub. Um, so there you go. Are there APIs for GitLab? Um, yes, I know that because I used to work at a company that used that leverage that integrated with Git, GitLab and I used to use GitLab and Bitbucket. So GitLab and Bitbucket both have APIs uh, that I, I highly recommend you check out. GitLab also has a, um, they do have a CI and they do have something very similar to actions. I don't know what it's called, um, but yeah, worth checking out. But reminder, I do work at GitHub. So like I, I, I probably can answer Git, GitHub questions better than GitLab questions to be quite honest. All right. So. What I want to pull, pull uh, mention too, as well as integrating with CI and CD and run through uh, GitLab runners. Excellent. Um, talk about integrating CI CD with GitHub's API. Uh, continuous integration is something that you should probably be doing and to be aware of. Um, it's there is a 
I don't know if uh, ATO just joined. Um, I run the, um, so this is a quote from Beyonce. I mentioned Beyonce as well. If everything was perfect and also apologies, uh, uh, kids are um, waking up at the moment. So it sounds like a, uh, it's a little loud. Uh, if everything was perfect, you'd never need to learn and grow. And uh, that was a, a quote from Beyonce in an interview she did years ago, I think, uh, possibly with Oprah. Uh, I probably shouldn't have that quote attributed better. But uh, what I'm getting at is there, as I mentioned with the opening issue every every week, like there are opportunities for you to automate those things. And what I'm getting into is like, I don't want to, I don't want to spend all my time reviewing PRs or spending all my time opening issues and closing issues and triaging. If I can automate portions of that, like I'm going to aim for that. And I'm happy to talk about stories of my experience with Hacktoberfest as well. Um, <laughs> no worries. Um, and how I sort of manage automations through Hacktoberfest PRs uh, for my, on my own. Um, part of that is, so a couple years ago, um, shortly before GitHub launched Actions, uh, we went to this whole big overhaul of taking in all the jQuery out of the front end site or the front end portion of the site. And uh, this is specifically github.com. And we had discovered this, this blog post will go into more details, but we had discovered that jQuery, for the most part, like JavaScript and jQuery, like you did most of what you wanted to do in JavaScript with modern day JavaScript uh, and the DOM. So we actually created a automation or a check they basically check if there's any jQuery and PRs. So every time someone up, opened up a PR, it would say, hey, you have jQuery here. We're moving away from jQuery. Let's focus on like writing it in JavaScript. And what was cool about that is they actually had a code snippet. So if you had jQuery, it actually converted it into JavaScript. And you can literally just copy and paste the entire part of that JavaScript and replace that jQuery and it would work. Um, so in the course of like a couple, like a handful of months, they were able to eradicate all jQuery from, from the site, which is like, this is not like a, uh, a knock against jQuery. It just happened to be a decision that engineering was moving towards, but they were able to sort of let the automation run the show when encouraging folks to, if you open a PR, it doesn't matter if you didn't touch jQuery directly, uh, but it'd be a nice opportunity for you to also change that file at the same time. So the best part about CIs is that if, when they work, they work. Um, and like, you should not have to like continue to think about them if they're up and running. So keep that in mind. Uh, so I want to talk about GitHub Actions, which is it's as similar to GitHub apps, but instead of GitHub apps being something that you install in your repo, which I didn't mention, you also with GitHub Actions, it's already available to you in all of your repos today. So it's, it gives you ability to run arbitrary code snippets inside of your, your code, uh, through the power of YAML and, and VMs and, a bunch of other stuff that I don't have to go into in great detail, but just know that it's a really powerful tool and it's available to you today. So going to like the workflow automation piece too as well. And I want to talk about GitHub Actions that's that uh, in workflow automation uh, aside from CI and CD. Um, so I mentioned identifying repeated task. Now, uh, I believe most of us, I don't know how many people outside of the US are, are watching this, but I think basketball today is like played in like 252 countries. I think it's a, the number that was out there. Um, would have been great to phase out <laughs> query, jQuery. Yeah. Um, so this is a basketball court and I'm bringing this up as an analogy. Um, so as I said, basketball, it's, it's a global sport at this point. Um, but the stick of basketball kind of like soccer um, or football, uh, except the fact that you dribbling, use your hands instead of your feet. So hopefully I'm not going to explain like, Hopefully I don't get you to snore uh, too soon, uh, but I'm a big fan of imagining every issue as someone's first issue, which is a Stan Lee quote. Um, so if you've never heard of basketball, hopefully I can teach you something very small, but this is a basketball. That's the thing and that's orange little ball. The line is basically directly pointing to the hoop and within basketball, you have a team five on five. And for the most part, you leverage your entire team to make sure that you can get the ball in the opposing team's hoop if that makes sense. Okay. So there was this concept earlier in the 2000s, the mid 2000s of full court layups that happened all the time where folks like one person would take the ball in, check it in, and then take the ball all the way to the hoop with that, with ignoring the rest of the team on the court. Uh, and this was, it's, it's not a phenomenon. It's kind of like a, there's a term called cowboy coding, uh, which is you, you write code and you basically do it all. 
Um, I've worked with a lot of people on different engineering teams where it happened to be like the one rock star on the team. Sounds like Alan Iverson. So I actually used to have a, a screenshot of Albert Iverson as part of this, but I condensed the talk and removed them. But yeah, exactly Alan Iverson. So if you're familiar with the 76ers in the mid 2000s, uh, he is the person I'm actually focusing this idea on. But essentially, you want to be able to leverage your entire team. Yeah, you don't want to work in silos. You want to, don't want to ball hog. But instead, you want to actually play to your strengths. So in basketball, uh, similar to this, this movie slash book called Moneyball, where they leverage statistics to uh, improve the game of baseball uh, and predict things, uh, they took that same concept to, in the NBA. And they actually discovered that there's this one spot on the court called Area 31, and it's 31% of your shots go in the hoop from this point. And this is a big deal because if you know that every single shot taken here, because uh, it's particularly this spot because most NBA players are right-handed. It's also the, the, how close you are to the rim in the arc you can make. It's actually a very difficult shot to protect or to defend against. Um, so knowing that you over index and you optimize your plays, unless you're Michael Jordan, notice notorious ball hog. Um, you should watch the documentary. Uh, documentary. Um, Michael Jordan, he actually spent a lot more time passing and uh, elevating other people around this uh, the team as well. But um, I think there are other ball hogs. Actually, I don't want to draw, I don't throw out names because uh, um, <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody if I start naming uh, your star player from the, this, the team you root for. But <laughs> name and shame. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll refocus my efforts. I, I grew up a Magic fan, Orlando Magic. I'm from Florida. And uh, I now live in Oakland where the Warriors, um, they used to win. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that if you over-index and you, you play to the strengths, so that way you take the ball instead of hawking the ball, uh, you can actually play and then shoot from area 31 from the player who's already positioned there. So that is the goal. Uh, fear the beard. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the idea of automation. It's actually play to the place where you know you're going to make the most shots and the most wins. Um, so if you identify pull, uh, sorry, if you review pull requests once a day, um, one of the common things people do is they take their pull requests and they go to Slack and then they paste it in there and then mention the team. Like instead of doing that, why not automate the notification that PRs are opened inside of Slack or discord or telegram or whatever it is, like automate that portion of that. And that's what I'm getting at. And this is where I'm finally going to talk about GitHub actions. I know this was a roundabout way to get you context, but quite honestly, like the, uh, I'll, I'll drop in the repo one more time. Uh, that is a self-paced portion of the workshop that you can do at your own pace, uh, whatever you would like. Um, it doesn't have any of this context that I, I talked about, um, but it will get you up to speed and sort of leveraging actions today. So GitHub Actions, they are open source, like the majority of actions are open source projects um, that look like this. So this is a GitHub action called GitHub script. And what I did with GitHub script earlier this year, we hosted this thing called the GitHub hackathon. And the way we powered this hackathon is we powered it with the GitHub, GitHub repo. Um, so all these submissions here on the hackathon page were also submissions that added JSON to the, this is a view app. Um, so specific, specifically grid sum, if you guys are into view, but we would add JSON to a project. And then that JSON would then give us a PR. Uh, then that we would leverage an action to basically check to see if this submission was valid. So not only did I check to see if the submission was valid, I checked it with an action. So I had an action that validated the JSON that was submitted. And if you had the bare minimum of what I asked for inside the terms and conditions for the, the, the hackathon, then you would get, you would get sort of semi-approved. So then at that point you would be, I would be mentioned. Uh, so we had three teammates on my, um, on my team that we get a mention that said, hey, okay, the PR is open, the action's been validated. So then at this point, the only thing I had to do is check to see if it should be on the homepage. So we had this GitHub script that I wrote. So you can see the five lines of JavaScript that I have below. This is directly in my YAML file. And I'm leveraging this using the GitHub action on line two, uh, which is just a GitHub repo that I just showed you pre previously. So this is like bare bones, like what actions are. And they're just basically GitHub repos that run arbitrary code uh, inside of your repos. And uh, the way I did this is I had a conditional that if it was either featured or labeled good, then it would then merge to PR. And then once you've merged a PR, you've then been approved, you've been notified and said your actions would approve, you will get your, your swag um, 
later in the month, which is basically what we did. So we automated that entire thing. And then if I had the feature label, it'd show up on the homepage. If I had the good labeled, it'd just get merged, but it wouldn't get added to the homepage as a featured, uh, featured GitHub app. And because I had the GitHub app on my, my phone, um, I would basically just go every morning, go through all the PRs that were opened. And then I would go to see if the readme was good, see if the action was like unique. Um, in the sense that like, did they do something novel? Was it interesting? Should it, does it warrant being on the homepage? And if it was, what I would do is I would then uh, merge that by adding a label. So I had a get out action that once I added feature, it would actually merge that directly into the, there. And then I'd have it featured on the homepage. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, this is something that we actually, uh, we actually, there's a blog post out there publicly. I don't have a link. Um, but we, this sort of process of leveraging automation to merge those PRs, um, was, it was amazing actually. Like we ended up only doing this three team mem members. We had three team members because of time zones. So we had one person in Australia, as I mentioned before, we had another person on the East coast and I was on the West coast and we just sort of cranked through all the submissions and we validated all the submissions. So the effort of us writing a hackathon for a company like GitHub with 50 million developers um, was pretty low. Uh, all the effort went into setting up the, the actual repo of the site, um, which is what I want to work on. I'd rather work on that than answering emails. So I'm going to hit a, um, a pause point right now. Um, I have a YouTube series called um, Get Action Traction. So if you wanted to see videos of how GitHub actions work, uh, I'll just drop that link there right there. Um, but I wanted to actually move into, uh, I do also have a repo as well. Um, so we have, I think 10 minutes. I can't remember if, um, honestly, I, I think I did, I did this earlier or I did this last year. There were two sessions uh, and I believe that we end this session in 10 minutes. So we'll have a second session and at the top of the hour. So what I'm going to get at is once again, I'm going to drop this link here. And I think what we're going to do is I would like everybody to participate in the action by going to this repo. If you haven't done this already, you should read through uh, and then activate an action I've already built for everybody, um, which is invite inviting someone to your, uh, the organization. So this is a common thing uh, for workshop. <laughs> uh, workshop leads are, sorry, teachers, moderators. Uh, well, this is the same session. Or is it a continuation? It is what you would like it to be. So if you have questions about actions, I can actually, I can veer off into other directions because the slides, the slides themselves are linked right here. And then this is also an open source repo. So um, once you've actually, I'll actually just see if anybody's actually done this. We have, okay. So we had a couple of people actually trigger the action itself. Uh, what's cool about this is we have, roughly 200 people who are now triggering the action. Uh, and we could see that two minutes ago, oh, it looks like we had, okay, cool. So we have a bunch of actions running. So let me talk about the actions that are running in this repo. Um, they're all, they're explained as well, but you can see that I'm inviting a bunch of people into the organization uh, itself. This is a very nice thing to do if you, especially in the remote world, like I, I don't want to take 200 emails and try to invite everyone into this, this project. Uh, but I have this action called invite a contrib contributor. Um, if you are interested, I just went to this actions tab here and that's how I get here. Uh, if you did not have any actions in your project, it would actually take you here, which gives you an option to add actions. Uh, there are, I don't know how many actions there are. There have to be at least 2000 actions in the marketplace themselves. So these are all marketplace actions. Uh, but there's a, ton more actions that are actually hosted open source that are available to use. So keep that in mind. There is, I don't want to like Apple app store this thing and say like there are actions for everything. Uh, I don't think there are actions for everything yet. Um, but there are a lot of creative actions. Uh, so what I just did is I clicked into the action for, uh, scowl something, their name's actually off, uh, obstructed. But what I'm getting at is that I have an action that it's called invite contributor. It's run. Uh, so it looks like it's uh, Blake Neal is the one that it ran. Uh, I'm actually printing that inside my code to actually see who it is. Um, is it possible to trigger an automation test to validate a feature prior to um, uh, the merge? Yes. Um, 
Angie Jones actually has a action that she wrote um, for validation and doing integration testing. Uh, Angie Jones is actually, I don't know when she's speaking here at this event, uh, but she shared me her action and I don't have it actually offhand, um, but there is it tomorrow. And I would struggle. Um, she sent that to me through, yeah. Anyway, uh, she handles a lot of testing. Uh, Cypress has another one too as well. Um, I would also say inside the curriculum too as well, there is an action for formatting linting code as well. Um, so yeah, this is this is this um, content is really for you to be go through self pace and try it out yourself and then see sort of the stretch of what actions can do for you basically. And that's the hope for this conversation. And that's what I'm probably gonna focus. I'll probably focus less on slides at the top of the hour and focus more on sort of talking through different actions. So I might actually just start with the basketball references just for the sake of time. Um, but I did want to point out real quick as well that you do have uh, this action that's completed and ran. Uh, I can see the, the workflow file, which I do also have. I can also click directly into it, but inside my .github folder. So the .github folder is a place where a lot of like cool GitHub features live. Um, it's a lot of like hidden tips and tricks. Um, but the one thing I did want to point out is that instead of actually pointing it to a repo, I'm actually running my action directly in the same repo that I'm working out of. So if I can figure out how to zoom out, I have an action right here. I have a Ruby file. I've got a Docker file. Uh, so that's the other thing. I could actually run actions directly within the project itself by using Docker. I do have a YouTube video on how to actually not use Docker. Uh, if you don't want to use Docker, you can actually do this with action.yaml as well. Um, it is in the, <laughs> here come the notification emails. Oh, you know what? That was the other thing. I forgot to turn that off. I apologize. Everybody, if you are, you're probably gonna get 200 invite emails. Um, that is right. Whoop. <laughs> All right. I'll have to, I wonder if I could fix that in 10 minutes uh, before between, in between sessions. Uh, but welcome to this workshop. It, uh, you're also testing your notification emails as well. Um, yeah, is everybody getting, I wonder, is everybody getting, oh, I just doxed my uh, email. Uh, excellent. Lots and lots of emails. You know, it's because I was, I actually forget about this because I, because I work at GitHub, I get emails for everything that happens on GitHub. So I actually turned off emails for GitHub. So yeah. I don't know who that guy is, but yeah, you blame him. But I did want to point out the code that makes this work too as well. <laughs> Subject and yeah, well, honestly, if you want to learn about automating your emails too as well, I'm sure uh, somebody can can run a session for that as well. But I just wanted to point out that I am using OctaKit to make this run. I did write this in Ruby where I can write this in Python or JavaScript or whatnot. I chose Ruby because really because I just wanted to write Ruby um, to make this work. I haven't wrote Ruby in a long time, uh, but I'm looking for the word invite. Uh, you can also write the word invite me as well. Actually, that's what I said. You could invite me or you could write a handle. So if you want to invite somebody else, you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, these are my 30 lines of Ruby code to make this work. Uh, we automate our way into this, I guess, automate our way out. Yes, exactly. You know, and I, honestly, I think it's because, um, uh, I wonder if I can turn off emails here. Um, but yeah, that, this is pretty much, um, the, I guess the, the crux, how do I, I don't think I can turn off emails. Yeah. I think it's going to be, the notifications are going to be on an individual basis. So like I got zero emails from all this and I, I always, I've done this workshop the sixth, the second time I've done this this year, but this is the largest crowd I've done this for. So my apologies, um, yeah, usually it's like about like 15 people who um, who end up getting their emails, but yeah, here we are. All right, so that is that. Um, I did want to walk through the rest of it. Um, is there a reason for per private repo license don't include GitHub Actions? Um, per private repo license don't include GitHub Actions. Oh, yeah. So it's it is because you are using an older version of GitHub. So if you are, so is that the, you're paying per, not per user, but for how many repos you can have? Uh, we made a change. So 
a little bit of inside basketball or inside baseball, whatever you're to call it. We made a change in the pricing. We made GitHub free for everybody. Uh, this was really to unlock, um, to make it easier for folks to leverage GitHub. We also made a change to how the pricing structure works for teams as well, which I believe GitHub teams is either free or a much cheaper uh, than it was previously for that reason. But we also made changes to how we do pricing with private repos because the amount you only have a limited, you only get 2000 action minutes um, per um, organization. Um, so in order to get more action minutes, you will need to, I had this, I slowed down on that because I had to think about how the, the structure of the pricing is. Again, I work with mostly free customers and open source, so I don't really know the pricing off the bat. Um, but I bring that up because that, that's why. That is why it's limited. Uh, it's because you're, the way the billing works, it doesn't work well uh, with the older version. Um, yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, automated ways to this GitHub Actions, yeah. Licenses, no or the licensings, yeah. So yeah, that is, that is pretty much it. I think uh, I'll drop in the link again for the repo. Um, it will, I have to miss the second part of this talk, but so far it's really interesting. A plan of running through, example repo, checking good actions. Yeah, and I, I have, oh, thank you very much. Thanks for stopping by Joe as well. Um, yeah, there's lots of information about actions that I've been putting out in the open. That's why I pointed the YouTube video. That's why I have the, the repo, which is get action traction as well, um, where you could, if you have specific questions for actions, Feel free to ask them there. I do reserve the right to point you to support if you have a specific question about your use case. Uh, but get, get Action Traction is the place that I've been sort of funneling all my um, experience. Uh, actually, the videos are what is what really came out of the, the workshop that I've been doing. So craft work became the traction. And um, that is where I'm at. So I, I will actually, where can I find the this panel recording? Uh, that is a question for the, uh, we do have a help desk here for all things open. So you can ask it there. I believe it's probably in the frequently asked questions as well. Uh, I don't know where the recording will be to be quite honest, uh, but it will be available. And here we are. Also, I highly recommend check out um, your GitHub notifications and filtering those. Uh, I personally have turned up all my notifications because I, I exclusively use the GitHub app as well as the notification panel. So here I've got, I've got a notification for everybody who's been invited here. Okay, so you're actually getting notifications on actions, not actually invites, that's why. Uh, I also have those turned off, um, but that helps because I can actually go into my actions and turn those off. Um, here we go. Do, 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 do. Questions. Second part recorded for those who may be able to attend. Yeah, second part will be recorded. Uh, I believe so. Just trying to share with my teammates who are unable to come. Yep. But I also haven't done anything other than watch. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. If you if you didn't join, then you won't get the notifications. There we go. Oh, please don't guess my password. All right. Um, Set up email address to receive notification of purchase or track triggered. Uh, I want to be able to turn this off. I knew, sorry, I haven't actually uh, <laughs> Beyonce question mark. Uh, uh, a true developer never tells. Um, yeah, my thought was that the notification would actually be off because I don't have them turned on, but do, do, do. that is something. I didn't even get to, I, I want to do a video on artifacts in the, the future. All right. <laughs> Zero cool. <laughs> That's a good one. Hack the planet. Um, excellent. I'm happy to answer more questions too as well. Um, I wonder if, how many of folks, actually, how many folks are going to stick around? Let's say yes, if you're sticking around for the second half. All right, everybody. All right, so uh, let me find the chat real quick again. All right, well, for those who stuck around, those are all the the hardcore folks who really want to learn about actions. Um, let me close that Zoom link as well. 
playing the stick around schedule is sort of improv with work. Yeah, that's the beauty of, um, you know, the online remote conferences, uh, I tend to always have on open while I'm doing emails or like engaged. Uh, very few conferences I'm like super active in and like, it's usually the keynotes is usually the part that I'm usually super active and engaged in. Uh, the rest of it, I'm sort of, it's like a buffet at this point, um, online events. All right. All right. So uh, I see the number climbing back up. Um, since we have a lot of people sticking around, um, I will probably in 15 minutes do a rerun of just the, the MBA portion of the talk. Um, but I did want to walk through the rest of this. Uh, I think I did talk about GitHub notifications too as well and being able to turn those off. Um, my assumption was that I was gonna only going to be the one getting action notifications, but they changed that. I forget when they changed that, but now anybody in the org gets the notifications as well. Um, how did I make that GIF? This, I assume this is what you're asking about. So I made the, I made the actual logo in Sketch because it's the only design tool I know how to use. Um, and then I actually had somebody who I know who does After Effects animations. I told them exactly what I wanted and then they just did it. So that's how I did it. Uh, I asked a friend. <laughs> it's the easiest, sometimes the hardest way to get things done because uh, you never know when you're going to get it done. But um, yeah, that is, that is pretty much how I did it. I think I was watching a, I wasn't watching another video. I was watching something. Oh, it was a tutorial on how to actually do that. And I got like some of it done, but then I couldn't figure out the rest, uh, which is basically the 8-bit. There's an 8-bit filter in After Effects. Um, and then the rest of it is just like generic After Effects stuff, like blinking and changing stuff. All right. So the second session was meant to cover the rest of this. I was gonna walk through uh, this as well as I think the, the, the best part is actually talking about all the different types of actions and the sort of fielding questions if people had questions around um, different ideas for automation. Um, but perhaps what I'll do, since we're sort of transitioning and uh, a lot of the folks who have, uh, who are here now, we're here for the first session. Um, I wanna talk about some actions that I, I use today to sort of expand the scope of, of folks' thoughts of actions. So this project itself, uh, the Dutt Pont mentioned if the workshops are recorded. Uh, I should probably, uh, I think the workshops are recorded. Uh, I mean, oh, you know what? So like normally in person, the workshops are not recorded, um, but to be honest, I should know this because I can see I can hit the record button. So I, I assume they're not recorded. So I guess what you see is what you get. Yeah, because last year on um, the Zoom window says it's recording. Oh, does it? Okay. So yeah, it. Um, then I guess it will be recorded. Not to keep you from getting through what you want to what. Yeah, I was saying like last year I was in person at the event in North Carolina and uh, the my workshop was not recorded. Um, so my expectation is that not all of them would be recorded. I think the keynotes and main stages usually are recorded, but um, it looks like it's something is recording. If not, I'm available um, on the internet um, using my, I have a GitHub and I have a Twitter, which I didn't even slow down to even show my GitHub. All right, so I'm gonna just jump in. I'm gonna talk about a couple actions, then I'm gonna move it back in the MBA exp explanation, and then I'm gonna go through the rest of the, the workshop material. So uh, we're just gonna start now. Uh, so I wanted to point out real quick, so this is my repo. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention that this is run by a GitHub action. So GitHub profile made, readme's were a thing that we shipped in August. Um, it's basically, you can actually have extra stuff in your repo. I actually have the action turned off uh, for reasons that I need to fix later today. Um, but the cool thing about this is that this repo itself is powered by the GitHub action. And I can show you here. So I, I had an idea of basically taking the profile readme and making a MySpace page. And the way I do it is, uh, and I think I have a, I have an older version. So you can see that I have a GitHub action that actually is um, adding folks here. So 
honestly, I forgot to actually even look at this, but yeah, other people have actually added themselves, <laughs> added themselves to my, my top eight, which I encourage folks to do a couple months ago. I haven't really been paying attention to this previously. Uh, but the way this works is I have a developers that YAML. And if folks add themselves to the list, uh, it will actually add the top eight. So I just, I adjust the list to create a top eight. And then I have an action that basically populates and creates this, this readme. So, and the way that works here is I do have a Ruby file, create readme. Uh, I have an action that runs this, this Ruby code. Again, I was really into writing Ruby uh, earlier this year. So um, there it is. So yeah, this, this is the Ruby code that creates the readme itself. Uh, and then this is the, if I go into older branch, this is the GitHub action that generates that. Oop, did I just hit back? Okay, here we go. So every time an issue is opened, and that's the other thing, I ask people to open issues to add themselves. Uh, so every time an issue is opened, uh, it runs this, this arbitrary code here that sets up Ruby. So you can actually set up the environment. So we do have a virtual environment that actually includes Ruby. Um, it has also Ruby version 2.6. Uh, if you're familiar with Ruby or Python or whatnot, it installs the dependencies. Uh, and then finally it runs that Ruby file and then creates a, that Ruby script actually creates a temporary text file uh, to sort of manipulate and create the, the readme. Uh, and then, um, oh, and then finally it creates a pull request. So if this has been successful, it will create a pull request uh, and it'll actually leverage that person's name as a title, uh, which you can see at least one successful one here, which is Sean Grove, who added this uh, quite a few months ago. So my GitHub action not only does all that stuff, it also creates a PR, uh, adds a note to close that issue that's open. Uh, so this is the issue that Sean opened. Um, and this issue also gets created from a template as well. So I've automated creating a top eight somewhere to like what MySpace was back, what, man, 12 years ago? No, longer than that, 15 years ago. Um, so that, that's one action. Um, definitely check out, you can check that out on my, my actual BWG profile. Uh, it's linked pretty easily. Uh, what I did want to talk about is some actions that I use here inside my open source project. Open source is a project to find your next open source contribution. Uh, we were participating in Hacktoberfest uh, and one of the things I like to do is I have this welcome.yaml and this welcome.yaml is every time someone opens a pull request, um, there's a, a note that I, I'm going to make in a second about the target. So normally this would say pull request, uh, but I'll, I'll make a note about target. I'm just saying it out loud so I can slow down and, and mention that. Um, but every time someone opens a pull request and it's your first pull request for the project, I want to actually create a note that says, hey, welcome, thanks for making your pull request and taking the time to improve open source, you know, make them feel welcomed, uh, even though this is a bot that's doing this. Uh, say hello by joining the Discord. And I did this intentionally because uh, during Hacktoberfest, you get a lot of PRs uh, for folks. Uh, sometimes there's an issue attached, sometimes there's an issue that's not. And I wanted folks to not only open up the PR, but to come say hello. Uh, full disclosure, you get a better chance of me merging your PR if you say hello versus I just get a bunch of PRs that are on random things that I wasn't looking for. Um, so this is one actually I did merge because it was actually a really good one. Uh, this was random and during Hacktoberfest, uh, but actually this was really good code. So I was like, I need this. Um, and it actually was solving a problem that I didn't know. Uh, but there's one that I actually talked to Jerry about this uh, and he opened it up. Um, so he got the generic uh, welcome message. He joined the, the Discord. And what happened when he joined the Discord is I was able to have the conversation with him, um, which was this right here. I still put, I put, posted this here just for the context uh, for the storytelling aspect of it. Uh, but we chatted in Discord and it was mainly because all this stuff wasn't filled out. And I wanted him to, the reason I do the welcome message in the Discord using an action instead of doing it on my own and he would have to wait until I would like wake up or until I was ready to actually message him. Um, so I do this because I want to have that engagement, that interaction, uh, and then I can answer from discord pretty easily. Um, so I guess what I'm rambling about and getting at is that I was able to get him to fill out the rest of the, his description in the discord because this was a confusing problem that he identified 
but he didn't do any identification directly here. So that way, other people who are contributing on the project, they have context on what's happening here. And I really, I really want the history of my, my code to, um, to be available for folks to go back and learn why are we using this Webpack plugin. Um, the, the real main reason is because we basically stopped support of Node 8 at this point. Um, and I had to make that very clear. So I, I was able to talk to him. He was able to update, update the README, update everything else to say, okay, we could only use Node 10 and beyond. Um, so if, it does, if this project does not work for you, it's very clear in the contributing MD that it doesn't work uh, because you're not using a, a, a newer version of Node, um, which I do all the time. So we were able to go back and forth to do that. Um, there's a couple other things that I do about, I use actions for, but what I want to do, all sessions are being recorded and will be made after the conference. Thank you. All right, answered question. Um, so I bring that up because that is a, a real life use case of how I leverage actions. I am overusing actions in this project, to be quite honest. Um, not only am I doing the welcome bot, it's great. Uh, there's another action that I, I love using, which is called take action. Uh, and the way this works is I'm actually pointing this to another repo, uh, which is here. Uh, it's a repo that I created there. <laughs> There's not such thing as too much automation. Thank you. Thanks for having my back. Um, but yeah, here are the, like the sort of light instructions. I did drop my YouTube account uh, in the chat earlier. Um, so for folks who are interested in checking out um, how this project is made, because this is actually the subject of my my YouTube series uh, for GitHub Action, Get Action Traction. Excellent. So I'll just drop the, the playlist here um, for folks who want to watch that on their own time. Um, but what, I, what I'm getting at is when I have a contributor of the project, um, a lot of times, especially during Hacktoberfest, uh, I get a lot of folks who, uh, who want to work on issues, uh, but then they find out very really quickly, do I have 22 issues? Only Actually, we do have quite a few more that we've actually created. Um, only eight of them are unassigned. And, and the reason for that is because I, I encourage people, if you want to work on something on the project, if you're just driving by or just, just want to try out a React GraphQL uh, site or a project, um, I, I recommend folks to assign themselves to an issue. And the way we do this is I have it clearly identified here to type the word dot take in the comments. So similar to what we did with the invite me, uh, you could also do dot take uh, using my action that I created. So um, I create a lot of these little small actions because I know if I got on this call with 200 people, again, I, I can't take 200 emails and then add them to a list and then and include them. Um, actually, historically, GitHub, well, I actually took this from GitHub's uh, onboarding experience. So if you start as a new engineer at GitHub or new employee at GitHub, uh, we basically have everybody join an org and then they teach them how to use GitHub and Git. So this is for marketing, sales, pretty much everybody who starts a job at GitHub, you go through the onboarding and they teach you how to use GitHub and Git. Uh, and the way they do that is they, they add you, you have to go into a issue and, and then at, um, mention your handle or your name. And then that name will then uh, be added to the org. So I just took that from our onboarding class and uh, figured out how to do that. Uh, shout out to Express for their triage team. I have a triage team. Um, so yeah, there's that. For those who are here and sitting, uh, I do want to uh, respect that some people weren't here for the last session. So if you just stopped by, um, the question is, do you know about GitHub Actions? Would you like me to, to I can re-go through um, the sort of high level of GitHub Actions, and then we can jump into the, the actual material itself. Interesting. Do you parse all of them looking for that key and then switch? Uh, does that open up the code injection into actions? Um, so yeah, it is possible um, for code injection and actions. And part of the reason why my, my MySpace action is shut off because there was an opportunity for people to in inject any code they wanted to. Um, I do cover this. Actually, I cover it in a video I haven't shipped yet. Um, actually, I'm editing it right now. Um, but yeah, because... Let me show this. So this one, it will be a little more challenging to inject code because I actually have this directly running. Uh, so this was a bash script that I was running uh, here. I think GitHub does a really good job of actually um, pr preventing folks from doing whatever you want. That was the thing I wanted to ask. So David, great question. 
Um, so one answer is the fact that I have this in, a, in a action.yaml, I can actually sanitize the access to this GitHub token. So that way not anybody can just do whatever they want. Um, the, sometimes the challenge is that you could actually run arbitrary code inside of issue comments too as well. Like I can run actions on issue comments. You could technically do some code injection if you wanted to, um, but GitHub does a really good job at sanitizing a lot of the stuff. Um, but I did forget that the one thing I wanted to mention too as well is the pull request target. And that was this one. So this right here, uh, and this has been a, a, it's a common sort of like, I guess fumble, not fumble, but folks who get involved in actions, like the, some of the common use cases are open source things. So if I run an open source project, let's just say I run Rust or let's just say Python. Um, I run a Python project. I want people to be able to interact with my project. Um, so the way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna have an action that runs on pull request. Now, the problem is that GitHub token that I was just talking about that I have access to here, this runs on the GitHub token for the person who triggers the action. So if David triggers the action to open a PR on my project, it will leverage his GitHub token. If David doesn't have access to open a PR inside my org, the action will fail. And the way to get around this and something to be very clear of, like you are getting around this and letting, I'm letting David actually open up a PR on my project by adding this target. So what happens with this is that I'm telling GitHub Actions to use my token, the token that's directly, that's on uh, me as the maintainer of the org. So that way anybody who does not only has just a fork can actually run their actions and they will actually, sorry, they can run actions based on their PR and it will work because it's actually running on my target, not on his or theirs. Um, so hopefully that answer questions for, um, yeah, for like uh, code injection as well. Um, I would say if you go in the community forum, a lot of folks, like if you go to this github.community, there are a lot of questions on like why actions aren't doing the, what they think they can. And usually the, the answer is because of security. Um, so like a lot of times people want to do some like really nifty things. One of the most common things people want to do is push to protected branches. Now, if your branch is protected in that you could only you could only merge things if it's been approved, then that is it makes sense on why actions cannot merge a branch, uh, even if it's a it's an automated bot, bot, because you could also trigger the action as a non-code owner of the project. So there's like a lot of limitations there. There's a lot of work. There's some workarounds that people have shared, but if you yeah if you go in the code like. I've seen this community forum since its inception because um, we, we migrated from another platform. So all these questions are pretty much since actions started. And um, what I'm getting at is that a lot of the, the sort of edge cases she's here to hit is around access and token um, management. And it really just comes down to like, how much access are you trying to give? And if you are really trying to give away a bunch of access, my recommendation is you probably should build an integration, a proper GitHub app. And that's where GitHub apps really come in uh, in the consideration too as well. Um, so I briefly mentioned in the last session the difference between GitHub apps and GitHub Actions. GitHub apps being the something that you install on the repo and gives access to all the repo, which is what everybody wants to do with Actions. Um, but I think when you hit that sort of that ceiling of like, I have a token, it should be able to push to a protected branch, but it can't. It's because you should use a GitHub app because the GitHub app will will give you all that access. So. That was a roundabout way to get to here, uh, but I did want to talk about uh, workflow automation as well. For this is a refresher uh, for GitHub Actions. Their focus here is actually the take logic, uh, an arbitrary logic that you want to do and rinse and repeat, uh, and hopefully sanitize if you're using tokens, uh, and then build stuff on top of the GitHub API. That's what Actions is really meant for: is to give you better hooks into GitHub into the GitHub API. So going back to the basketball uh, analogy, which I won't harp too much, but my my analogy for welcoming new contributors by pointing them to the Discord is something that I, I know was a falling off point for anybody who wants to. Um, does GitHub offer or suggest training for an entire org or devs to level up? Uh, yes, we do have GitHub training, but usually it's attached to your paid account. Um, 
so yeah, we do have a training team, but it's like really, I think it's mostly on the enterprise side. Uh, we do have a lab course too as well, which I do have a slide for, um, but your whole team could actually go through training that's self-paced. And a lot of the trainings that we give to the enterprises, uh, they're also distilled at these trainings here, lab.github.com. There are also trainings on DevOps and actions as well. Uh, DevOps with GitHub Actions. So if you wanted to go like level up, there you go. It sounds like, it looks like there's only Davids in the chat too as well. <laughs> Anybody else besides David here? Uh, just kidding. All right. So uh, I bring this up because, yeah, my analogy for full court, <laughs> uh, full court uh, layups is that I'm not a David. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, this is another Dave. <laughs> just David's, uh, Jonathan's masquerading as a David. Um, <laughs> this was the, the only day, this is the David session. Uh, what a, what a popular name. <laughs> my, my dad's name is David and my brother's name is David. So I, I missed the, um, I missed the David call. Um, but yeah, going back to the welcome session, like the welcome bot, that is, that is what I was really one of the sort of mentioned that I knew that every time someone contributed to the code base, a lot of times, so a lot of times the project that I work on, um, open source, like a lot of people don't know what to do with it. So a way for me to get feedback directly and not have to wait through uh, issue comments is actually get them into discourse as, as fast as possible and then have a conversation with them and ask them what they think and what they think, like what, what are places that we can have a new features? Like I can have a conversation with folks and it's just way, it's a way for me to sort of have that conversation. And if I have a captive audience, that's really why I do that. Um, and the other thing is like being able to pass the ball to area 31, which is again, the highest rated place to make points on the basketball court is area 31. So the thing that I do with the take issue, um, like I know if someone wants to work on something and I know I'm going to be with the kids all day when doing some other, some other stuff, like I can't respond to them and assign their issues um, because I have to shut myself off from, from working even for open source stuff. Um, I want them to be able to take the issue. So if I see someone that's like, Hey, I want to take this issue. I respond back with a save reply that says, read the contributing ID on how to actually uh, take issues. Excellent. So, and then we're, we're really focused around identifying repeated tasks and automating those. Uh, and I mentioned get a hackathon as a, a sort of case study on how we automated using labels to merge in PRs. Um, and that's what that looks like. So with that, and I think for the most part, I see a lot of familiar names from the last time. So I'm going to assume that folks, uh, the majority of us have, were from the last time. Uh, but if you weren't, uh, what I'm going to do is just drop in the slides and then drop in the workshop material as well, which I want to make sure I'm giving you the right link. Uh, and then we don't have to go to the invite me stuff because we did notice that the notifications will blow up um, for everybody uh, since they're actually enabled. And I was mentioning this before and then we got cut off, but um, yeah, that was a recent change that everybody gets notifications. And I distinctly remember who asked for this uh, in the open source world, uh, where they wanted the entire team to be notified when actions failed or ran. Um, and not before it was just the the, the repo owner. Um, so let's move on for that. There was an action um, that I wanted to talk about too as well, uh, which is part one of this tutorial. Um, actually, there was an action that I wanted to mention too as well, which this will automatically fail because we're going to have merge conflicts uh, because of folks. Um, yeah, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> uh, that's the old, that's the, uh, the other Brian. There's at least two of us here today. Um, so uh, that take VR and the org takes VR. Yeah, so this is a, a base, an action that I have running. Um, we, I ask you to add your name to um, a PR. Uh, and I think there should be at least one merged. Yeah, so 10 minutes ago, um, I'm going to assume this is another David too as well. <laughs> but um, uh, this person actually opened a PR to add their name to the list. And that's literally what it is. I should probably delete all those names in the list eventually. Um, but a couple things happened. Uh, one thing that's happened is that this was actually labeled. So not only was this PR created um, by this person, it was labeled by a GitHub action. 
it was also merged by GitHub Action um, and then eventually deleted as well. Um, and the way I'm doing this is I, I have this auto merge file. Uh, I just grabbed, here we go. So it's called auto approve. So I have two actions that are running directly in this repo. Uh, and this is the way I'm doing it. So I'm running on pull request. So keep in mind, um, this is not on target. This is actually a pull request. So this actually, um, at the time of me creating this, this, or, uh, actually one year ago when I created this workshop for the first time to run it, all things open, um, I created this action workflow because pull request target did not work. Uh, so this specifically is on pull request. Uh, and that's why I've invited everybody to the repo. So actually I can remove that <laughs> as part of the workshop eventually. Uh, but I did want to point out that, uh, Harry created an action called auto approve action. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because I needed an event to happen to then trigger a label being added. So I do want to point out that GitHub actions are run based on GitHub repos. So Harry actually created this repo to auto approve um, pull request. Uh, you can see Harry also is using pull request target. So he's, he's more up to date than I am. I actually need to update this. And honestly, I didn't even think about that until the question came up from David earlier um, that that would have been a blocker, but yeah, can't post a GIF, but imagine Beyonce singing who runs the world, <laughs> who runs the world? David's. All right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's Harry's action. Um, let me see if I can get back to the repo that was just in. Oh, here we go. Um, the other thing I want to mention too, in part three of this workshop itself. So again, uh, I dropped the links, but I mentioned that all the, all the content that I'm going over can be self-paced. So I am bouncing around providing context because I think the better, what I can give you here in only 45 minutes is context. Uh, everything else you could probably do in an hour uh, on your own and your own pace as well. Um, but I did want to point out that I am passing in a GitHub token. Um, this GitHub token is leveraged directly in Harry's code. Um, this is actually, a, you can now infer GitHub tokens. So at the time of this creation of this, this project, you had to do this. You actually, this is not required anymore, uh, to be quite honest, because uh, GitHub tokens are already available, as you saw in my previous GitHub uh, token here for take action, uh, take action being the project that's the subject of my YouTube series. All right. So let's uh, close some of this stuff too, as well. Also feel free to drop in questions. If, uh, if there's some context that is missed and lost, um, that's what I wanted to do. Um, inside a, a GitHub action workflow, you can run 20 jobs and just, to, to point this out to you, I'm not this, I'm basically giving you the workshop part three um without reading it uh but i think 20 jobs uh you know actually i'm not, i don't actually link it here but note that you have 20 jobs that can run within a workflow at a time uh so i can actually run 20 jobs uh at the same time if i wanted to uh at the moment i'm just running one uh, and inside those jobs you can have synchronous steps as well so these steps will run one after the other so this one will run if this one passes and does not fail, then this one will run. And knowing that once I've approved the action, I'm basically, when approved, uh, I just want this to, to run and get approved. I'm then gonna add a new label called auto merge. And then I have a whole nother action that's called auto merge action, uh, which is running on my bot branch. I didn't point that out to you as well. You could run these on targets. So I'm running this on a tag. I'm running this on a branch. I'm running this on a branch. Um, and again, these are GitHub repos. So this is how I'm, I'm basically doing that. Is there a reason to run that many, uh, when jobs versus steps? Um, yes. And I have, I have an action, which this is open source too, as well. Uh, this is the biggest action I have ever seen in my life. And this person actually came in through, well, I pointed them to support because, um, I didn't have an answer. Um, but there's an action limit as well as, um, there's an action limit on size. So you can run our, our time. So you can run 20 jobs. You could also run 72 hours <laughs> to run an action. Uh, keep in mind, you only get 2000 minutes in a limit. So 72 hours being, what is it? Uh, uh 24 hours times 60 minutes.
Oop, 24 times 60. Okay, I'm typing it in the chat. That's why it's not working. <laughs> okay, 24 times 60, 1400. Yeah, so if you ran this for one day, uh, you would definitely hit your, your minute limit. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind. But if you were paying for minutes, you could actually run up, for, up to three guys. Um, but yeah, so running separate jobs. So sometimes I have actions that trigger other jobs as well. And you can do that as well, but you can just do it based on the job ID. So the answer is, yeah, there is a reason to run that many, um, especially if you're doing some heavy orchestration. Um, I'm trying to find uh, the link to this action that was the other limit, which is size limit. There's actually a max size of 800, 800 KBs. Um, there we go. So this action has hit our, our size limit. Uh, so this is a full stack Ruby server edition. Uh, you can see this action is running on multiple versions of Ruby, uh, which is also the reason. I actually, um, yeah, you get a thousand extra minutes. And then if you're an enterprise or if you're a paid tier or whatnot, I think there's like negotiation or something like that that happens. Uh, again, I'm not, I don't do sales, so I'm not really sure what the deal is on that. Um, but yeah, not only they're running different versions, they're running different flavors uh, of of Linux. Uh, but if I can get to the bottom of this, it is like thirty six thousand. No, it's twelve thousand lines of of code of YAML to make this run. Um, so they're running on legitimately separate jobs, uh, and they have a reason, and it's really because they're doing DevOps. Um, so yeah, this thing's absolutely insane. Uh, if you want to get a closer look to this. Um, there you go. I'll drop it in the, the chat as well. Um, but yeah, there are, there are reasons and there are people who want to do some pretty amazing things in GitHub Actions. Uh, this is like, um, there's also the idea of artifacts too as well. So they're actually taking, they're storing the output of their actions and storing them into a artifact, which I don't have time to get into, but just note that these, that's a thing that you could do. I did record a whole video on that and I haven't even published it yet, but, um, I keep pointing to this video series, Get Action Traction, um, for those who are curious of what I keep pointing to. Um, but yeah, what is the other question? Can you explain real quick how actions are executed? Do they just fire automatically after creation or do you have to set them up and enable as such? Yeah, so they are already enabled in your repo by default. Now, if you forked, if you forked this repo and there are actions running, you have to actually actively enable them. Uh, that's a security thing as well. Um, we don't want you to be able to fork a repo and then like run a Bitcoin miner without knowing. Um, that's a very specific use case, but like it's a use case that actually has happened. So for that reason, we want you to be able to um, enable actions on forks. Now inside of your actions as well, you can actually run, uh, you can actually turn these off. So if you only want actions to run uh, self-hosted runners, if you only want actions to, if you want to disable actions, if you want to latch local actions. So local actions being the action that I wrote directly in this repo is a local action. So if you only want actions to run directly within their repo, then you can turn that off as well. Um, you can allow selected actions as well. So if I only wanted to run full stack Ruby, whatever, or whatever it's called, uh, you can do that as well. Um, and then you could also set up the uh, artifact uh, log retention. Uh, well, you can set up the log retention. So my logs themselves, um, I think I had one here that could have logs. Let's see a, a successful one. Uh, I could take logs and actually create artifacts. You know, I'm gonna bounce around a bit too. So context, uh, have you mentioned how self-hosted actions work? I have not mentioned that and I wasn't planning on it. Um, but self-hosted actions run based on like your URL. Um, so you host that and you provide that URL into, um, to your repo. I did want to point out that I do have a lighthouse action that is using, cause I keep bringing up artifacts. So I might as well show it. Let me see if I can get this to open. Uh, where's my audit? So I'm running, this is really, uh, this might be overkill and not really needed, uh, but I do have an artifact. Oh, this one failed. Uh, this, all right, so I was, it looks like this is broken. So this should get fixed. Um, 
but I am running Lighthouse and then providing a Lighthouse link to report to store as an artifact. Um, it looks like my artifact failed itself. Um, so the context of, I think it's this one. My Lighthouse score. Okay, it looks like everything's failing. All right, so something for me to fix later, but um, I was storing a link to the Lighthouse report directly inside the action run for workflow. Um, this is really just to prove a point and to, to walk through a example in a previous um, uh, session. Um, but yeah, I was not planning on, yeah, it looks like all my artifacts are not uploading, but you can also set retention on how long you want the artifacts to be here. Um, for self-hosted runners, um, yeah, it's also gonna be here in actions settings and you should be able to configure add a runner here and then you could run that in your container or Azure DevOps or whatnot, you could do that here. So that's how it works. Uh, and then once that's set up, then it will run, but I don't want to run a self-hosted runner. All right. Um, yeah, and there's some pretty good instructions on that too as well. You mentioned, yeah. Question, what is the difference between GitHub, Azure DevOps? Oh, GitHub and Azure DevOps, do they have the same features? Uh, I've literally never used Azure DevOps, so I'd be the worst person to ask that. Um, but perhaps somebody else in the chat in the Hangouts can answer that question. Um, I would say TFS or VST. What is the, I don't know what that version control system is, but probably that's the biggest difference. Um, I don't know if TFS does TFS work in GitHub. <laughs> it has that, this is a confused TFS user trying to understand GitHub, May 23rd. Um, yeah, I don't think there are some plugins, I guess you could make to get TFS, but yeah, um, that convert get, sorry, convert TFS to get, um, excellent. I use added DevOps. Yeah. I don't, I don't have a specific like, um, apples to apples comparison, uh, mainly cause I never use it. Uh, TFS is the foundation. Oh, you specify you want to DevOps either TFS or get got, got it. Yeah. So yeah, looks like Jeremy. Jeremy has the answers. Uh, is it better to make a separate repo or a separate branch for actions? Well, the answer is mostly depends on context just asking. Yeah, it depends on your workflow. So me at GitHub, and I wish I could open up a GitHub repo, uh, sorry, a GitHub org repo. We have limitations of what we can do at GitHub because we use GitHub Enterprise. So I can't just arbitrarily write whatever code I want and run actions directly inside of my code base if it's hosted on GitHub's org. Um, so there are not a ton of limitations, but we do run a lot of audits on our code uh, through things like code, like Security Lab and CodeQL. Um, so we can figure out we have some bad code that's actually running actions, but it's really around preference and how you want to organize code. Like it, it's it's the tune of opinions. Um, yeah, yeah, what is it? Um, Anyway, there's no framework for how you should um, you should write your actions. I personally, I write all my actions in separate repos because I do a lot of talking about actions. So it's much easier for me to point to things like take action as a separate repo. Uh, so that way I can provide context on this is a thing, it's hosted on Marketplace. This is how you do it. You can view it on Marketplace, which I didn't even get to as well. But yeah, this is my action hosted on Marketplace. I could also see a bunch of other actions here that are all, all separate repos. So yeah, if your context, if you want to share your actions uh, with other folks uh, and other orgs or other teams, so like this is going to be a better way to go. If like myself, I have an action that's running on a Docker file directly in the repo that it's using, you could also do that. Um, I would also say that Babel, and I use them because they're top of mind. Uh, they have a folder of actions and they just point it directly to this one folder. So all their actions for the entire Babel org live right here. So it's a preference thing. Um, so, and yeah, it's between you and your team or if you run the team, then it's like, it is exactly whatever you, you would like. All right. So we kind of went a roundabout way cause I was half explaining how the auto merge action works the other approve and merge. But yeah, these are synchronous steps. The previous one has to pass for it to, 
for it to complete or else this one would not run. It gets skipped. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, I do have an action that is in the context of, I think I was close to one tab, but I wanted, oh, you know, what? it's, no, nope, this is not it. Sorry, and uh, feel free to slow me down if you have, if there... all right, <laughs> here we are again. All right, for the sake of uh, context, I guess I probably end up just, uh, is it all sessions, I wonder? Yeah, I wonder, um, yeah, what might be happening, but I guess we could we could speculate, but I'm gonna drop in links to the, the slides and the repo again, in case uh, folks have um, lost all context. Uh, and I was answering a question or was I rambling about something and cool. But I, I think what I'll probably just end up because like we roughly have 10 minutes left on the, the schedule. Um, I'll share my screen again and um, I'll just round up the, the conversation just by saying the actions are, they're a, a pretty powerful feature. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with them. I think if you are excited about things like automating things that are either redundant or things you do all the time, like there's so much opportunity for, for GitHub Actions and sort of improving your workflow. So I'm hoping that me just showing and sort of clicking around in a roundabout way, giving context to how I use Actions and leverage them, um, hopefully been insightful um, and at least uh, sort of started getting your, your brain uh, in the getting the context of like what actions can, um, can benefit for you. Um, I will say that again, they, the, the content itself, like not knowing how the structure was going to be. And I, I did this once before early this year and it, it went really well. Um, I, well, we didn't have any sort of interruptions in the middle, but uh because I know the online pacing for workshops, it's very challenging to uh, bring people along for the ride the entire time as well, keep it engaging. So the intention was really share the repo. So that way, if you don't, if you don't get anything else from this conversation, at least you have the repo where you can learn actions on your own. Uh, and the slides really just provided context on my story and how I use actions and how I, I basically share it with others. Um, the other thing is that we, we never got past step uh, one um, in the conversation, but the I wanted to talk about how the auto merge actions. I use this action, this whole setup right here um, for not the setup, but um, the auto approve setup for things like dependent bot. I actually auto merge my dependent bot uh, PRs as well using this exact structure, uh, which you can check in the open source repo, how that works. Um, if you don't know what open source repo, open source, I think it's, I think I own the SEO on sauced open. Um, but anyway, but the one thing I did want to mention too, as well, is the, the second part of the part two of the workshop is leveraging actions in a very novel use case too, as well, which is Mad Libs, which is kind of silly. But um, what I really wanted to do is that I wanted to be, be able to validate things like issue templates, which we were using for my team for the longest time. Uh, this exact action, this variables and markdown, where I would create a template for folks and you open up the issue using the issue template. And then what happens is all the information you fill in in the notes, it actually populates the rest of the copy for the issue. And this is really around, there's a lot of people open issues in my team's repo who are not on my team. And I don't expect them to have all the context about my team. Um, so what I try to do simply is this open issue you tell me four things and those four things will be populated throughout the, the comment structure of the issue. So that way everybody else on, the, on my team can navigate the issue properly. So imagine things like asking questions on um, like what device you're using, what browser you're using, um, where the bug occurred and how to reproduce it. Like this answering those questions and links um, are getting people to open up Stack Overflow questions first before opening up issues. It's a, it's a nice way to basically have like a template system. So this actually will walk you through creating a, uh, a Mad Lib. If you aren't familiar with Mad Lib, Mad Libs are um, these puzzles where you just add in words or verbs and adjectives. 
and it gives you a funny story. So that's what this, this does is this, you just add a bunch of words and adjectives and it gives you a funny story. So that's how that works. Uh, definitely check it out. Um, feel free to pick it apart, copy and paste fork, do what you'd like. And then finally, the last part of this is, is CI. And I, I purposely put this as the third part because most people think of actions as CI, but I wanted to give other use cases of how you can use actions that are not just running your node test. Um, but this will, it will run your node test. Um, I go through an example where uh, I have a, a, for that same issue, uh, I mentioned in the first session, I created an issue for my team to do standup. Um, we, the way we do this is we actually have a week number that we put in the title of the issue. Uh, and this is a bit of code snippets to actually see how that works. It's, it's not a lot of code. It's like probably 10 lines of code. Um, but we run, we run tests using that. So I wrote some tests. Uh, you actually copy and paste some tests and get 200% cut test coverage, um, which is not possible because 200%. So two times zero is 0%. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you had zero tests and now you have two tests. Um, and then I talk about this other thing, which is uh, adding lint, linting to your code. So a lot of times we have specific ways we're going to write code. Things like prettier and things like um, ESLint, like you could use on the command line. But I always, I avoid that because I have an open source project that has, that takes contributions from all different walks of life and, and skill set, And I want to, I want to remove that friction that you don't have to use things like Husky or those, those uh, formatter tools that prevent you from committing without fixing the code. Like I want you to ship your code and then I'll be able to um, focus on that. But feel free to walk through that. Also, the last part is part four where you could, um, you can see a bunch of examples of actions. So that is pretty much it. Uh, I appreciate you coming through. Uh, I believe we only go to for another three minutes uh, and we can make room for the next uh, speaker to set up and have a conversation or less next workshop lead. Um, I, you can find me on Twitter, uh, which is BWO on Twitter. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, I am happy to answer actions questions and have a conversation. You'd also find my GitHub and other links as well there. So thanks everybody. Thank you all the Davids. Thank you, Jeremy, very much for, uh, for sticking around and hanging out. And uh, yeah, it definitely uh, stay in touch, I guess. <laughs> this is, it's been a ride. And then I believe just for context, I will drop in the link to the, uh, the workshop one last time in case you didn't get it. Maybe you jumped in late. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. I wonder if it was, I, I don't know if uh, the all things open staff was open, but I guess my, my speculation is perhaps maybe someone else was joining the call at the same time and uh, maybe kicked out the rest of the participants. I know sometimes also, I sometimes hit the big fat and for all attendees button instead of leave. Um, so that's also possible, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll make room for others to chat. But yeah, this was, uh, this was fun. It was nice to see all the people, uh, appreciate the talk too as well.